okay? These are some of the bundle of rights that go with real estate. So it's possession now. You, you should have that paper that shows the bundle. Um, I got some basic uh, concepts that I stand by as a realtor, okay? And one of the things that I do believe first and foremost is that housing is a human right, okay? Um, nobody should have to be in the streets. No uh, kids should have to all be confined to one room where there's a space heater and a lot of people in Philadelphia are living like that, okay? Nobody should have to live like that. Heat should <laughs> flow through all houses. People should be able to cook and store food. And we know that there are a lot of people in our community who are struggling, who are scared to say, this is how I'm living or this is how I was raised. You know what I'm saying? I do believe that housing is a human right. And I think that our government should support anything that gives all of us a decent place to live. Okay? In a decent, clean community without garbage, without rats. Okay, where, where I currently live, I live in Kensington by choice. I'm back in the first house that I bought because I tried to donate the house to my community. And the city gave me so much trouble. And this is a neighborhood where we got junkies. We had seven uh, junkies pass away on our block. Okay, in a two-month period on our street, we got rats about this big that conspire to dig their way into your house. So when the rats got into my house, where I had a metal grate on my basement window, the rats, they couldn't get past the wood, they couldn't get past the grate. You know what they did? They went to the place where the bolt was, into the, uh, the brown sandstone at the front of my building, and they dug around that bolt. And, to, and, and they were, the crazy thing is, the rats were gathering Oh my at my house <laughs> and from like about because everybody was telling me they were coming up on the rail and sitting there well they were all working okay and five in the morning my daughter would drive by to drop off her kids and she'd be like it's like seven rats outside the basement window they dug around that ball until they got in my basement okay so you know uh one of the assignments I gave to last week's class, did, did you think about the letter you're going to write to? Yeah, I, yeah, I'm actually started writing it. Great, great. I want, I want you to share that because one thing that I do want to share with, with Facebook Live and everybody, I have a city councilwoman who thinks that it's okay we got rats. We got rats run up and down the street. The junkies, you can hear the junkies at 3 in the morning talking about... Uh, you, the buzzer when I start talking crazy. Okay. <laughs> she, she's the one, she's supposed to stop me from talking crazy. But anytime I'm asleep in my bed and I hear a junkie go, Oh my God, look at that rat. <laughs> Come on now. You know? And I got a city council woman who thinks that that's cool. Okay. I ain't going to mention her name. So, um, so housing is a human right. We should all live in nice neighborhoods and we can do the work to make our neighborhoods correct okay and I think that the future of housing should include innovations that fit how we live and how we need to survive uh, in, into the future um, considering smaller spaces and every resident complete with an income producing figure okay so Helen was in last week's class and I'm going to reread the question and then I'm going to tell you what the book answer is and then when you look at your notes You'll see on, let's see what page. I got something in here about fixtures. Real estate. Yep. It starts with a picture of this beautiful house that one of my Facebook friends had up for sale. And it's a very good example of the difference between fixtures and personal property. Okay? <laughs> All right. So, so let's, let's backtrack a little bit. I'm going to read this question again. While moving into a newly purchased home, the buyer discovered that the seller had taken the ceiling fan that hung over the dining room table. Okay? So, mind you, buyer came in and said, boy, this place is jazzy. I love it. I love that ceiling fan. I'm going to put my dining room table right there. And the seller had not indicated that the ceiling fan would be removed. 
The contract did not address the issue. Which statement is true? Now, one thing about the questions on the real estate exam, really pay attention to what it's asking you. Pay attention to what you're being asked. It says, which statement is true? A, the ceiling fans are normally considered to be real estate. And we're going we're gonna to backtrack and go to the definition of real estate. Okay. I'm going to get you to tell everybody the definition of real estate since we went over that last week. Okay? Uh, B, the ceiling fan belongs to the seller. C, ceiling fans are considered trade fixtures. And D, ceiling fans are considered personal property. So those are the choices. Now what the book says is, the answer is ceiling fans are normally considered real estate. When in a box, when that ceiling fan is still in the box, a ceiling fan is personal property. Okay? But once it's installed in the ceiling, it's considered real property. Okay? So let's be before before I have her bring everybody up to speed. We're going to go ahead and skip to that page that says fixtures versus personal property. All right. And we got this lovely picture of this. It was a model um, home. It was a house that was fully staged that was up for sale in West Philadelphia. Um, and the question is, what are house fixtures in real estate? Now, a reader said, I put in an offer on this home because I was so impressed by the way it was decorated. I know this is, this is called staging, but I'm so confused. After I go to settlement, what exactly will still be here when I move in? Okay. A six foot by three foot rose garden lines the backyard fence. When we did our final inspection, the roses were there. But when we showed up the following day with our moving truck, we discovered that roses had been dug up and removed. Hey. Our agent said the roses are a fixture. Always walk through the home with the seller or the seller's agent to discuss fixtures. If personal property is a fix, or fastened to real estate, it becomes a fixture. So if you walk in a kitchen and you see kitchen cabinets, when you move move in that day, the kitchen cabinets should still be there. Okay? Mm -hmm. Nobody should be like, oh, I love these. These are custom. I, I had no intention of leaving them. If they're affixed to the property, then they're they're sold with the property. Uh, sometimes you do have to specify about washer and dryers okay some people may want to take their washer and dryer yes now could any fixture be negotiated as settlement as personal property yeah it could okay so let's say um i like to do a lot of wood refinishing so let's say in my living room i went to a uh one of those uh where you reclaim wood and stuff uh and i bought a beautiful ma uh, mantelpiece and I polished it and shellacked it and I put it in my living room, but it was always movable. Now, a buyer might not know it was movable. So you have to specify in the agreement of sale that this house is being sold without the large mantelpiece. There's a place on an agreement of sale where you can exclude. I'm taking the washer and dryer. I'm taking the big mantelpiece. I'm taking the mahogany doors off the bedroom. Okay. Um, yes. Right, let's say if it's like a like a fireplace or something like that, and they, the seller decides. Also, oh, let's just say it's a stage property. Mm -hmm. or, when you walk, did the wall through, it was a um, fireplace in there. But then in, when I when a, the house was bought, they decided to put a big old mirror and close it off. Mm -hmm. Is that considered um, personal property, or is that considered a fixture? If you see the house mm -hmm. and that fireplace appears to be installed and it's there and nobody tells you different expect that it's supposed to be there okay. when you move in but that's why it says that's the uh that's the biggest reason for disputes mm -hmm. is that somebody's moving out and they're like can okay. you make a list of what you want though like uh, like what you expect that'll be there at most times most times sellers and buyers 
aren't that picky. But if you see something or a conversation starts that leads you to believe that something's going to be missing. And that thing is the deal breaker. So you see this house with this nice fireplace and the big glass thing and the holder for the flat screen and all that. Mm -hmm. And it looks to be installed. And you get the idea, well, is she going to leave it? You can ask the agent to clarify that. Okay. okay. Everything about real estate is about putting it in a contract. Okay. So if you're... if if you've never seen this before, you know, and is the glass attached to the fireplace and, you know, I see their flat screen is there. Does all this come out? Is it from Ikea? I don't know. You know, are they going to take it? Ask. Specify. Put it in a contract. In real estate, you really don't have to worry about much because you put it in writing. Okay. Everything should be in writing. Okay. All right. So, I'm going to give you the chance to tell... What is land from last week? So we're going to bring everybody up to speed about the whole fixture issue. So the first thing that we studied was what is land? Oh, my Lord. <coughs> um, I don't know what land is, but I do know what real estate property is, real property and uh, improvement and all that. I don't know what land is. Okay, so you know the next definition. What was the next definition? Um, so I do have the definition of land. So you know what? Because we want to start with the... Do you want to read it from the uh, paper? Sure. Yeah. Okay, so the difference between land, real estate, and real property is on the... It's right in the center of this package. Right here. On the land or what happens to the land under my house. Oh, my fault. Land is defined as earth surface extending downward to the center of the earth or upwards to the affinity, including permanent attachments, natural objects. Mm -hmm. Okay, so land. Land has a specific definition in real mm -hmm. estate. Like okay, that. it's everything that's on the surface of the land. So if it's an oak tree, that's yours. If it's a duck pond, it's yours. Okay, if you're buying that land, everything to the core of the earth is supposed to be yours. Supposed to be. Because we live in municipalities, if there's public sewers. Yeah, so like, it, isn't it different? When I was reading, the one thing that they said is different is water. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. that got different laws or regulations when it comes to buying land or something like that. Yeah, it, it, it's going to be a lot of different things that affect your rights and responsibilities and ownership. Your municipality is going to define a lot. Okay? So... If you live in Atlantic City on the waterfront, there's probably a way different law that affects you than if you live in Erie, Pennsylvania uh, on, the, on the edge of a lake. So your municipality is going to define a lot of things, but basically land is everything attached to it, okay? And down to the core of the earth, so if it's gold or oil or natural gas, that's yours, and everything up to space. It's supposed to be yours. But we know airplanes, police helicopters. That's air rights, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's land. That's the specific definition of land. So the house, the condo, the shed in the back, the white picket fence, the gate in the backyard, okay? Anything that's... Uh, Human-made additions. So land plus permanent human-made additions is real estate. All right? And I'd also say, don't take anything that I say for granted. Research it. Research everything a couple times. We got Google. So if I say that this is real estate and you get in a discussion on Facebook and they're like, no, that's not what real estate is. Look it up. Google it three or four times. Research everything. Because I'm just helping you study. I could be wrong. Okay? Um, and real property, Helen. It's the earth surface, airspace, um, subsurface, anything that property attached to, to the nature, the people, and the legal rights. That's right. So when you get to real property, it includes the bundle of rights. Okay? So, you bought land. You bought your dream house in Mount Airy. It has a backyard, the front yard. Uh, it even has a little alleyway so you can get in between the two houses. Uh, there's a house on it. You got your front steps and everything. 
And then when you have real property, you have a bundle of rights. And those rights include possession, okay, which means you get to go in and out of your house. You get to say who goes in and out of your house. Control. You get to do what you want to do in your house, I guess, within the law. Now, that was one of the questions yeah. I got to look up. I don't know if you got the was, right to do stuff yeah. illegal in your house. It was okay. on the test term. Huh? It was on a little test term. Yeah, yeah. So that uh, everybody needs to dig deep because there's like this trick question. Is it everything legal or, you yeah. know, so. Uh, and you have the right to enjoyment, to exclusion, yes. and to dispose of your property. To give it away, to will it to your children, to rent it out to sell different rights associated with your land. So they give the example of the, what is it? It's the house, the farm. Go ahead, Ryan, you want? Yeah, something, something like the house, I believe, then uh, like a, a um, like a garage or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then like underneath was gas or something. Or right. Coal, so you can sell the rights to like the gas underneath and still own the real estate on top and also forget what the other one was, though, that they went about, though. But it was basically, that was the example they gave. So kind of like fracking. Right. Yeah, so you could own a big swatch of land that include some underdeveloped land, a parking lot for a condominium, and then they find that it's natural gas on that undeveloped land. You could still own it and give somebody the, the right to extract the gas. Um, one of the uh, lessons that I found on the Internet talked about a farm. And so we can kind of flow into this whole what's a fixture and what's personal property. So if you have a farm with apple trees and you cultivated those apples the whole year and you own the land and then you sell your farm, but you make a deal in the agreement of sale to come back and harvest your apples. So apples are personal property. The apple trees... If somebody says, I'm buying an apple tree farm, those apple trees are supposed to be left there. But you could still have the right to come back after you sell the farm and harvest your apples, which is your personal property. Is that kind of like um, when they say it's severance? Because I noticed something about severance day. You can actually have a land and you can sell like a, a part of a land and still keep the outer part of it. Right. And, and they, mm -hmm. call it, they call it severance or... Or, yeah, or I know it has something to do with like an easement. Like you could own a property and someone behind you could have a landlocked property. And so they could use a access road or something to cross out of theirs, uh, across your property to meet a main road. Okay? So we got it. Land, real estate, and real property. Real property includes the bundle of rights. Okay? All right, so now we can better understand the thing about fixtures versus personal property. So if you looked at this picture, and this is the house that you saw, okay, do you think the dining room table is still going to be there? No. Okay, because that's what? Personal. Personal property, okay. Uh, refrigerator? No. It doesn't have to be, could be, but if it's a brand new stainless steel refrigerator, make sure that it's going to be there. It should be because they're including refrigerators with most purchases. But sometimes you buy a house that doesn't have a refrigerator. Okay? Uh, let's see. Can't see too much in this. Yeah. Yeah, there definitely shouldn't be a hole there. Because, why? Because it's installed. Okay? So it's installed. It's under that countertop. That dishwasher should still be there. Mm -hmm. So, did anybody have any questions or comments? Um, about the straight up. Like, how? Because, I mean, I know, like, the government has airspace. Mm -hmm. But, like, say you wanted to... Put like a hot air balloon above your house or something like do you really own the air above your house like up to well like they said you're supposed to but your municipality if you're right near the airport and you want to put a balloon there you probably can't <laughs> yeah. because of you know what your municipality 
all those uh, those airplanes have to go in and out unobstructed. But you see they're licensing people with the drones. So you could be at your house and have your drone flying. Or, uh, uh, I mean, even a simple example is your kid in his room with a laser pointer. Mm-hmm. You know, pointing at every airplane that goes over the airspace in, uh, of your house. You know, we know that it's laws of things that we can and cannot do. Yeah. And the example that they gave in the book too, they also talked about like now there's like rights to the sun with solar energy and solar panels. They said like if you were to build a building on your property and it was going to be taller than other buildings that was around that might have solar panels, you you might not be allowed to do that based on the laws if it's infringing upon somebody else's sunlight who's using solar energy on their building. Mm -hmm. Mm I said I would fight that <laughs> because the sun moves this way, and if they're, you know, mm-hmm. if their things are angled a certain way, they can angle it straight up, which this is saying anything directly above. Mm-hmm. So they would have to angle. Yeah, it'd be a fight though, but it's all. <laughs> yeah. all. <laughs> okay. Um, going back to page number two, uh, one of the other things that I try to encourage people is that if you want to get into real estate investing, um, be brave. And I put a little picture of a house that was right on the corner of my block. It had a fire, but it's a corner property. It has a little, um, it has a little building on the side of it so that every once in a while somebody opens it up as a thrift store or a little corner store. So, you know, I say be brave. You might have to start here. You're not always going to start with a beautiful house, okay? And if this, if this is three or four thousand dollars, I would tell anybody get it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? So you're always running out to somebody selling hair. You run out to other people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you know, let's be brave, cause um. And then there are houses that are on, on the market that are so cheap, just because they have carpet in it that's still from the '70s, or there's a wall that's painted all black and no one wants to deal with that so that drops the price of that Mm -hmm. Um, it's easy cosmetic repair right and i mean we're in circumstances now in philadelphia where um the house that i have in kensington uh i got got it back from the bank because one of my children lived in the house um decided to put pit bulls in the house spray paint the house (laughs) (laughs) Who could have done something like that? And and then didn't pay the mortgage. And uh, I had about $40,000 worth of debt on the house. No, he's very good. He's very creative. So I have this really creative spray painted room. Um, <laughs> there was $40,000 worth of debt. Uh, I was becoming an empty nester. And I had basically had this grand plan that I was going to give each of my kids one of my buildings. Okay. And so they took one building and put a recording studio in it. And the other building was the happy house (laughs) with the pit bulls and everything. Yeah. And so I was hiding out down here in Point Breeze. I had a commercial building down here. So I was like, everybody was grown. Nobody was calling me, asking for advice. So I'm I'm inside of my building trying to think, I'm going to open a chicken and waffle place. I'm going to have a, I had all these crazy ideas with a building I had down here. While my building in Kensington was uh, uh, going like this. And uh, (laughs) I end up selling my building down here in Point Breeze. And I said, well, what what am I going to do now? I don't have nobody's business to mind. Everybody's gone. Nobody's taking my calls. I said, oh, I'll go back to Kensington and do the summer lunch. And then I can get right back in people's business, okay? (laughs) So I go back to Kensington, and I I look at the house that he had since vacated, and it was just sitting there empty. And, uh, and, And this goes to how you can get something with pretty much nothing. Uh, this was three years ago I bought the house back. Yeah, maybe even four. Yeah. Okay, so gentrification had not even been thought of in Kensington. Now it's being thought of. So basically, here was this house with pit bull feces, spray paint, and I called both of the banks that I had two mortgages, uh, $40,000 worth of mortgage. One was actually on the house, and one was for my son's house across the street. So I had another son that... that did some things 
but all the debt was attached to the original house. I said to the banks, the houses are no longer worth 40000 So can we work something out? And with a year's worth of negotiation, now think about it. This is how you got to think about money. A year, I kept writing. I kept asking. They sent out somebody from the bank to look at the house. As soon as the guy saw the house, he was like, oh, hell no, this house ain't worth 40. Okay? So I kept writing. I kept talking to them. I kept negotiating. And finally, I got a letter back from somebody that said 5000 And we'll forgive all the debt. Okay, so one mortgage company forgave all of the debt, and then the mortgage company that was in the first position just wanted me to have five thousand. So I bought back the house. Okay, so really in a year I made forty thousand dollars because it was forty thousand. I didn't have to have. I didn't have to pay them. All I had to do was come up with five, and I got the house back. Okay. Um, the way that I funded that was every, well, urban communities. So I, I don't know some if you live in Detroit or if you live in Chicago or whatever, you'd have to check and see. Um, but in Philadelphia, we have community development financial institutions. Okay? Community development financial institutions. Community financial development organizations, they are people who have money who are supposed to be helping us. Okay, <laughs> get the buzzer ready in case I go crazy. <laughs> I'm not going to mention their names, but they know who they are because some of their workers is my Facebook friends. Millions of dollars come into this city and people write grants and say, we're going to help the people in this neighborhood redevelop their neighborhood. We're going to fund new doors and <coughs> heaters and all this stuff. Or we're going to uh, finance entrepreneurs. And they're writing all these grants. And they get millions. Okay? And has anybody in this room ever got some money to buy some property or redevelop anything? Write that letter while it doesn't count while it's not going to hurt you, okay? You could write a letter, find out who your council person is, okay? Find out who your community development financial institution is. Find out who your uh, community development corporation is and who's running your RCO, which is that resident community organization that makes a decision. Whenever you buy something or want to rezone something or you want to open a tea shop, find out who those people are in your community. Okay? I see somebody, what do say? Uh, bring them on camera. Because <laughs> people trying to watch. People trying to watch who getting this education. Okay? So anyway, um, uh, write a letter. Now, while it doesn't count, just like in my neighborhood, we got a consistent pile of trash on the corner. Even if you go look on Google two years ago, <laughs> that pile of trash is still on the corner. OK, my city councilwoman won't talk to me until she said I get a better attitude. OK, but I'm still a resident of the city and I shouldn't have to have a nice attitude to complain about a constant pile of trash on the corner of my block. Okay, but I invested money in that house that I rehabbed so that I could do the USDA summer lunch. And after two years, the city shut me down. Okay, so now those letters become critical. So if you're not good at writing letters now, it could really hurt you. Okay, I'm $25,000 in debt because I fixed up a house for the kids in my community. I got a $560 payment every month that I have to make on that house, okay? And the city said a house is not a restaurant, okay? So now I've been two years writing letters, but I've been writing letters my whole life. My children used to say, when I get mad at somebody, I go to the keyboard. I be like, <laughs> <laughs> and I write the nastiest letters. So everybody should practice now. So you said you... You wrote a practice letter? You have a situation in your community? I wrote a, a half of a letter. 
Okay. I ain't All right. I ain't know what to do. But mm -hmm. pretty much, um, I, I found out that um, my city council person is Chanel Parker. I live in District East. Um, and um, I pretty much wrote about um, not 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 on my block, but it's um across the street from me. It's a lot. And um, um me and my neighbors, we kind of want to like plant flowers and put trees in, just to make it like a look a little more prettier. And that's what my little about. My little purpose, I was inviting mm -hmm. her to ask, um, is there any kind of way that if we fund it, can we use that lot? It's just, and it's really small. If we fund it, if we buy everything for it, can we cut it down? Can we, um, you know, redo it? Um, can we put a fence around it, something like Home Depot? And can we use it for the kids to play in or maybe like make, uh, make a garden? And that's the letter I was going to write. I mean, I don't know if she'll write me back, but that's the letter I was going to write. Mm-hmm. Very, very good. Okay, so everybody should practice writing letters. If you're going to be a building owner in any municipality, if you're going to open a business in any municipality, if you got any type of dreams, even if you're going to be a resident in any municipality, write the people in charge. Because when you write, um, they got some uh, formula that if I write and complain about the trash, I'm actually representing a hundred other people mm -hmm. who also saw that trash who didn't write, but they're mad, okay? So definitely everybody write a letter. I'm so passionate about this. Yes, ma'am. And another question I had too is that um, I read something about something called e, um, e treat. it's called E-S-C-H-E-A-T. And mm -hmm. I think it means that um, if somebody die and this, the property is abandoned, Mm -hmm. Um, like, can you buy it? Like, for instance, like, if I, if I found the house, I found out that the person brought this house and maybe they went to nursing home or maybe, maybe they just died and they had no family. Could I go to City Hall and find out how much the house cost and buy it? Yes. Oh, I can. A, fr a friend of mine did that okay. in New Jersey. That's the only reason I know that. Okay. Actually, she was, they offered, um, they asked her if she wanted to buy it when she was only interested in renting it. And they, it was considered abandoned property and they said, sure. Mm -hmm. But it might be different here in Philadelphia, though. Oh, that's it, true. It, it differs. Yeah, yeah and in Philadelphia, it, what happens first is the city tries to take it. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. and then the city wants to try to collect on old municipal debt, which is uh, similar to our project on 48th Street. And that's yeah. when those buildings fall down and collapse and everything. Because yep. when somebody could be in them, mm -hmm. bringing up the neighborhood. But see, all you gotta do is write, write and ask. So who would I write to? I'm gonna write to City Hall, or I write to the person who actually owns it. Uh, you would first want to research who's the owner right. of record. Yeah, I, I did that. Yeah, and unless I know, unless I found out that the lady passed away, like probably I found out from her age, like she just really old, so she can't be alive. Okay. I mean, not like that, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, not like that, sorry. Yeah, you like, so like you saw the dates, she, like maybe she, she bought she, it in 1921, so I'm, you know so she's sorry, gone. Just, that was yeah. said wrong. Mm -hmm. But I found out that she deceased. That's what I meant. And um, and um, it don't look like that anybody else underneath it owns the building, or owns the house. Mm -hmm. And it's a pretty good, it's a pretty okay house. And uh, I went down to City Hall to try to find, like, how much taxes owe. They only owe, like, foot thousand on taxes. Mm -hmm. Um for the last like three years, and I went to City Hall and asked them if I paid the taxes on it, could I buy it? And they told me to go to 3801 Market Street and and, and try to bid on it. Okay. That's when mm -hmm. it goes to share mm -hmm. See, that's okay. like, if you do it that way, it puts it, but it costs more. anybody's grabs. Yeah, you know? but it costs more because like, when I went down to 3801 Market Street, they were bidding it for like 47 thousand and if in a Texas you owe, it's only like 22. See, it's a difference. So I was kind of like, like, why is it more? It's, it's, mm -hmm. I'm just the trying difference to get with that is when it goes for share, so they're pretty much trying to recoup the taxes. But mm -hmm. and then with the city, the redevelopment authority tries to get it first, and you pretty mm -hmm. much bidding against everybody to get their property. Mm -hmm. It's generally better to go like research the family, see if it's anybody yep. down the line. Yep. And it's just like it'll be an inheritance property. Say she didn't have any kids or anything like that. It could be a niece, a nephew, anybody that can prove that they're legally a family member. Can get mm -hmm. their property, so it's a whole lot of research you gotta do on the back end. Never, never try and go and say, "Well, I want the city to take it over, and I can go get it from the city." They're not gonna do it like mm -hmm. that. And it's only because, like I said earlier, I used to work in that department for the city, so they're going to try to get it for self and then boost the price up on the property anyway, just so they can <laughs> higher taxes you and everything like, like that. Yeah, your records, like when I went down there, I kind of spent them there. Listen, like I looked it up, I did my research. She only owes like almost four thousand per year in four years. 
So that's like sixteen thousand and like um, and, and she ordered like another six thousand like water or something. So all they gave me was like twenty two, and I went to Thirty Eighth Street and they selling it. Well, it's on bid for like almost forty thousand. I'm like, where's the extra money coming from? Like I don't have forty. Middleman fees. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's even just like say for instance, um, you see my sister was just going through this same situation with her property at the corner of our block. And it's just like, um, looked into it. She knew the lady. She's been going maybe like a year or so. Right now, the taxes, everything is paid up to date on this lady's house except for last year. And with her property, she has the house, but then she had the adjacent lot right next to it. And my neighborhood is nothing but development all up and around us. When I say I live off of Ridge Avenue, mm -hmm. my house on Ridge Avenue. Avenue is going for 400 and some like yep. thousand dollars, okay? Mm -hmm. We know everybody to look into it. So we did the research. She has no kids, no nothing. So it was like, you can go by one or two ways. Let us sit there and let the developers get it or try and go and squat. But you had to sit and squat for so long to get the squatters, you know, rights for the property. And who's to say, like, the money you put in, they can still come back and snatch your What is squatting? Mm -hmm. When you go into an abandoned house and you pretty much live there, you try mm -hmm. to pay the bills, you pay the water. Oh, you, you start to over for no Okay. Start to generate revenue for the city. You pay the water, you pay the taxes, you start to pay different things on it. But it's not a guarantee that you will actually be granted that in the time frame. You know what I'm saying? It's so it's too much stuff to go through. Yeah, just just to give you a, a, another insight on <laughs> squatting, a lot of times uh, people who are renters contact me and they say I'm in this house and maybe the owner got locked up or the owner died. And, you know, they tell me I made this repair, the pipes busted, I paid for this. And what you'd have to do is every time you make one of those expenditures, or if you added up what you did in a year, you got the heater fixed, you got some windows repaired. So your residency in that house is keeping this house from deteriorating. You take all those costs and you go into small claims court and you sue the owner. Okay, so the owner is locked up or dead. They're not going to show up in court. But what then you've created is a, a debt that's going to follow this property. Okay, so if it, if it were to go up now, I don't, I'm not a sheriff sales specialist or anything like that. But you're creating these liens or this ownership interest that at some point you could go before a judge and say, look, I was living in this house. The owner disappeared. I continue to take care of it, and you got to have meticulous records for a judge to side with you, okay? But then somebody could say, that a, a judge could grant you the ownership rights. I don't know if that happens. I'm not a lawyer. I've never been to court. I've never seen it. Um, but one thing you want to research in Pennsylvania is the conservatorship law. Has anybody heard about the conservatorship law? Mm -hmm. Okay, you know a little bit about it, right? A little bit about it. Conservatorship law, because we've discussed it in the other yeah. real estate classes. Yeah. What is it, conservatorship law? Yeah, the conservatorship law in Pennsylvania. Okay, so this is really good to know. Because other parts of the city, Germantown, is... Um, <laughs> <laughs> you haven't rung the buzzer on me yet. Yeah, you're getting close. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, they actually figured out how to monetize the conservatorship law. Okay? See, I'm only saying that because only four people watching me. Okay? But um, <laughs> um, the conservatorship law was a law that was enacted in order to help cities with blight. Okay? So what it says is if I, the individual, have a problem house next door, next door, in front of me, or behind me, I can file, it's about this much paperwork, but you can file it and go before a, a judge in the city of Philadelphia and get um, conservatorship, which means you are, they got to give you a decision in 60 days, and you are given the right to act as the owner of the property. So for an individual, it's the house across the street, the house behind your backyard, and the two houses right. on either side, okay? The way I found this out is I was working for a developer, 
and he had me researching houses in Point Breeze. So I was researching, let's make a common name, David Johnson, okay? And David Johnson bought the house, I think, in the 70s. So I could assume David Johnson is most likely African American. And as I dug trying to research this house, because the house was abandoned, so I know he was either dead or locked up or whatever, um, I saw that somebody went to court and their name was like um, Melody Horowitz, okay? <laughs> she went to court to get conservatorship. So when I saw this lawsuit, I was thinking, well, that sounds like somebody trying to take care of an infirm relative. I said, ah, David Johnson is related to Horowitz. I'm looking. So I started digging further, and I researched the name, and then I saw she went for conservatorship on another property. Then she partnered with two people and went for conservatorship on another property. So I said, now this lady can't be related to all these folks, <laughs> okay? And that's when I researched the conservative. That's how I found out about the conservatorship law. Wow. So people are saying, I want that house, knowing there's an abandoned building over here, and getting both, getting a two for one, okay? Um, if you're a nonprofit, you I think you can capture houses to the edge of the municipality. So my summer lunch program and my association is a nonprofit. So I'm on Reach Street. So basically, anything on Reach Street, if I felt like doing all that paperwork or had the resources or didn't run out of ink and get frustrated, I could file those papers and get the abandoned houses on my street. It takes a lot of work. But again, yes ma'am. Just for clarification, it, you, all you have to do is live on the block or does it have to be like directly across or you know connected to you? If, if you you're filing as an individual, mm -hmm. it has to be a house that directly impacts you. Oh, wow. And if you're a nonprofit, okay. it could be any house. Okay. Okay, so think of how many nonprofits are not grabbing those houses on our behalf and what sections of the city are having meetings where they are telling everybody, tell us about every abandoned house because we're going to get them. Let me, I, I mean, this is beside the point, but like, how do you become a nonprofit? Group? Yeah, how about the same question? Yeah. <laughs> Well, well, it, it, getting nonprofit status comes through the IRS. Okay. Yeah. So there's a whole there's a whole package. Yeah, that you could fill out. I did my own years ago. And, and just a tip, if, if, uh, from what I understand, if you have a nonprofit, you can also get any student loans you have forgiven. Yeah. What? That's perfect. Yeah. What? Are you serious? Yeah, I didn't know that one. <laughs> 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 you gotta look into that because yeah, 45 might change that ruling, but you might uh, look into that while you still can. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, I was about to form. I wanted to form a nonprofit, but I feel like an LLC would like be quicker, it's easier. Quicker. But like, so say I form an LLC. I mean, and still want to do a nonprofit. Would it? Would there be a way to? I mean, it had to be like totally separate. I believe under a nonprofit, you can have entities that are doing other things, but you got to stay like on mission. You can create the LLC and, and do and own whatever you have to do. Okay? You can create the nonprofit, and one entity can work with the other. You know, so basically, those are just two entities. You're an entity personally. You can create an LLC, you can create a corporation, you can create a nonprofit. It, you're just creating entities that can do things together, do things apart, and that are under different laws. Okay? okay? Yeah. All right. So, yeah, look up the conservatorship law because, and, and sometimes you, we, we don't have to invent the wheel. Mm -hmm. We've got nonprofits in our community. Sometimes it's hard-headed people at the head of those nonprofits, but first see how you can collaborate in your community. You know, I don't know why our nonprofits are not taking advantage of that. Why we're not having meetings in order to get houses. Okay, think about it. Why aren't we? Okay, we could be doing that. It could be somebody sitting in the office by themselves with a nonprofit that says, well, wow, 
If you show up on Monday and you show up on Tuesday and you're there Thursday to help and you take the desk on Friday, yeah, then we can have time to focus on getting these houses in our community. Okay, so sometimes that's what's stopping us is that we're not going and volunteering and finding out what the needs are of the nonprofit. And I, uh, even with my own nonprofit, I educate people about the conservatorship law, but and I've invited people to come help me. But who really want to sit there? The, the package you got to do is this thick. It's mainly typing and copying. Because to give you an example, how the conservatorship law works, I ordered the title report for a property on Reach Street. It's empty. It's abandoned. Okay. I pretty much know that it was probably purchased with a fake name. Okay. Years ago, when people were just going buck wild buying property in the Philadelphia, you can see a lot of properties that it probably wasn't a real person. Okay. I paid $250 for the title report. The way the conservatorship law works is they want you to notify all the 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 interested parties okay so you gotta send a certified letter to the owner of record you gotta uh try to prove to the judge that you sought out heirs okay so you gotta prove that then if he owed the water department you've got to let the water department know they gotta gotta get a copy of the lawsuit if he owes gas they have to get a copy of the lawsuit uh, so all the debtors on the property have to get a copy of the lawsuit that you're filing. So I have never been able to take advantage of the conservatorship law because I have ink in my printer sometime. I can't come to my job and be printing out all these. I'm sitting there. One day I was sitting there trying to type information. I was like, oh, my God, my eyes. I can't do it. You know, so we've got to partner up and start to take advantage of these things okay people got to start showing up and say well i'll bring my laptop and i'll do page 7 through 13. I yeah and then you know we all got friends that got that job where can you make copies of this okay <laughs> and then we go but we've got to start to partner up on things okay because that's the only way it'll get done so every state um, in later classes, we'll get down to breaking down some of the, the controls. So in Philly, you might have a house that's subject to city zoning laws, state laws, uh, but every state controls the real estate industry. So everybody is licensed by their state, okay? Again, in order to get your real estate license, you got to do 60 hours of approved training. And career web school, that's where I always do my continuing ed. They got a list of states that they service. Uh, let's talk about the home inspector, okay? And, and related jobs in the real estate field, okay? So, you can buy and sell real estate as an investor. You can work in a real estate office helping other people buy and sell real estate. Yes, ma'am. How many years ago? Uh, like early 2000. Yeah, you got you probably had to take it over. Yeah, but you can always ask, okay? Because just like um some states are reciprocal. I think I can go into Jersey and just take the exam, I think. But you just got to find out. Yeah. Um So, you can buy and sell real estate. You can help other people buy and sell real estate. In the city of Philadelphia, you can be a leasing agent. Okay, we got a lot of apartments. Now, uh, in non-urban areas, you could be a leasing agent for a complex. Okay, so, you know, Johnson Muse or whatever has 300 apartments and they're all spread out with little pool area and whatever. But in the city of Philadelphia, you could work for a management company and just go between high rises showing apartments. I did that years ago. And so usually you either get the first month's rent as a commission or some portion of that. So that can be pretty lucrative that you just get up, get up, get dressed, go in the office, get a bundle of keys and show apartments all day. Okay. If you work for one owner, you don't have to be licensed. If you work for several owners, you're supposed to be licensed. Okay. Um, <clears throat> You could learn staging. 
okay uh, uh apartment units and properties that are for sale need to be staged they sell better um and that's just uh studying uh decorating you know studying color schemes you could then consult with people who have newly bought houses or people who are renovating houses the real estate ins uh the housing inspector okay you don't have to be a specialist in any particular area you can learn how to make a buyer aware of potential problems that's basically what a home inspector does um, so he doesn't say the heater you know he'll say the heater doesn't work he can't tell you why it doesn't work but you need to get with the seller and decide what you're going to do about the heater